Hello everyone, I'm Danielle McLaughlin and welcome to July's virtual Fiction at the Friary. For those of you who may not be familiar with Fiction at the Friary, in the days pre-COVID-19, it took place on the last Sunday of every month at the Friary Bar North Mall in Cork City with featured guest authors, optional writing exercises, an open mic, jelly beans and a book raffle. And we do hope that before too long, we'll all be able to meet in person again at the Friary Bar. In the meantime, we have morphed into an online event. Today, we also have a book raffle for you. So we'll be giving you some more information after our readings and conversation on how to win those books. And you can find those details via Twitter and Facebook. And we'll have, but we'll have more details about that later. I'm now going to hand you over to Madeleine Darcy. Hello, Madeleine. Hello, Danielle. Um, before I introduce our lovely guest author, I just want to uh, thank our sponsors, um, who are Cork City Council, the School of English at UCC, um, J. Rapp O'Mara Solicitors, and Hogan Architects. And also thanks to Mike Darcy at the Friary Bar, and we hope we'll be back there again at some point. I'm delighted to introduce our guest author for um, Sunday, 26th of July, and it's Keelan Hughes. Um, Keelan's first novel, Orchid and the Wasp, won the Collier Bristow Prize in 2019 and was shortlisted and longlisted for four other prizes. Her poetry collection, Gathering Evidence, uh, won the Irish Times Strong Shine Award. Her work has also appeared in Granta, Poetry, BBC Radio 3, BBC Radio 4 and elsewhere. And for a short fiction, she won the Moth Short Story Prize and an O'Henry Prize. The Wild Laughter is her second novel and was published recently to great acclaim. Colin Barrett, author of Young Skins, said, The Wild Laughter is a raucously intelligent, tough and tender black comedy written in jaggedly beautiful prose. Jan Carson, author of The Fire Starters, said, A stunning piece of writing, razor sharp and shot through with Beckett-esque black humour. Roddy Doyle said, I loved this book, so funny and bleak. I loved the madness, the tone, the ending, the realisation, the third policeman charge of the whole thing. So welcome, Keelan, and um, we're delighted to have you here as our guest author this month. So now I'm going to hand over to Keelan, who's going to uh, read an extract for us. Thank you very much, Keelan. Thank you so much, Madeleine and Danielle. Um, I'm, I'm a blushing from, <laughs> from the introduction, so, so thank you. Um, and it, it is a shame that this isn't in a pub, so that I would have a very valid excuse for drinking <laughs> alcohol at four o'clock on a Monday. <laughs> but um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's lovely to, to be online with you, and thank you so much for doing this. So I'll just read um, the opening of The Wild Laughter. So imagine I'm... Um, late 20s, early 30s, Roscommon man. The night the chief died, I lost my father and the country lost a battle it wouldn't confess to be fighting. For the no-collared labouring class, for the decent, dependable patriarch, for right of entry from the field into the garden. Jurors were appointed to gauge the casualty. They didn't wear black, don't they know black is flattering? The truth isn't. They kept safe and silent. I didn't. When is a confession an absolution? And when is it a sentencing? I'd like to find out. I suppose there's only one outcome for souls like us, heavy going souls, the like of mine and the long lost chiefs, and not a good one. But I'll lay it on the line, if only to remind the people of who they are. A far cry from neutral judicial equipment. Determining the depth of rot that's blackening the surface can't always be left to deities or legislators. Sometimes what's needed is to tie a string around the tooth and shut the door lively. 
He was a bright young thing, my brother, Cormac. His mind was a luxury. The face was rationed, it must be said, but there's not a body with everything. Part T-Rex, part pelican. Picture that menace of features. Close-eyed, limb-chinned, skin thick as the red carpet he imagined laid down beneath his wellies. Tall as the door he expected to be let in. When he was 12, he looked 20. The mind was ahead too, as I said. The odd girl went in for such a harrow of a fella, the odd girl and not the even, on account of his brains and his chesty conduct. Not that he was liberal with his cleverness, but there was the atmosphere of it. Knowing at any moment something you'd say would be turned inside out like a child's eyelid to traumatise you, to show you the violence behind it that you never meant. Or maybe you did. As I say, I didn't resent in his mind. Early on, its potential was fearsome, but he cached it away too long until it curdled. He could have his intellect. I had the looks, the chief's mud-coloured locks, yellowing now like a stack of cut grass drying out for haymaking. Hey, square skull, cultured nose, the kind of eyes you might describe as pea and mint soup, best served cold. I was shorter than my brother by a foot, but divvied up as good as David. I had the emotions of every girl in the county Ross common over a barrel, a fact he found hard to swallow in spite of, or maybe because of, the pelican chin. Except in gobshites, I liked people. And I was well liked for no good reason, as far as Cormac was concerned. I'd zilch to contribute in the way of knowledge or guile or points for the home side. And sure, how else can a person be of use? Sport lent him an absence note for the farm work that needed doing, for the care work, for the life sentence. His absence meant my containment. Stay put, heart, he was telling me. Stay a mile wide of my circle. There's only so many circles in a town the size of a suitoring. What I did and said reflected on him, so he wanted the sticks brushed from my hair, the charm wiped off my face. He wanted me capable of summing sums and changing tires, to be mad on mechanics, Newtonian and Fordian both, to know a stock option hadn't to do with capital. But I wasn't after his or his bio's approval, that panel of experts. Where we're from, infants get swaddled in hessian sacks. I never bought into an alternative reality, no matter how low the interest rates limboed for the new millennium, no matter how you could go the whole way to Dublin on a test drive. And if you weren't satisfied, no one would lambaste you or demand a tenner for petrol. Cormac did clinch a deal with the new reality. Nothing daft. He didn't barter his youth, as many did, for a barge on the Shannon or a conservatory extension or an interior decorator, or a rotary milking parlour, or a personal stylist. No, he wanted a college education, a new way of life, less like subsistence, one that didn't stink of fear and survival, a challenge that called for grey matter and not grunt work. He did fast maths on how the island was transfiguring. One of them scenarios, like... If a train is going at such and such a pace in the direction of a stone wall, that's absolute gas crack on the train. What are your options? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that fabulous reading. It's so good to hear you read Hart's words. And I found listening to you so many details that I love from the book, from your prose. Um, surfacing for me again and new things coming out in the language and I wanted to talk to you about that magnificent language that you have in the wild laughter because there are such delights um, not only in every page but in every paragraph and there's such such inventiveness and such richness in the language and I'm wondering, does that richness of language and that originality, does it come in in the early drafts? Is it there from the very beginning? Or is it something that makes its way into the book in the rewriting? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I don't have any other way of writing. I really wish I did. <laughs> I wish I could. Uh, I, somehow I end up kind of writing voicey stuff um even when i'm trying not to um and uh, i don't and it comes out that way in the first draft so um zadie smith has this brilliant essay about the two different classes of writers although i, th I think there's a spectrum but you know the micro um planner and the macro manager 
and the micro planner does the kind of if it's a if you take the analogy of a house you know they um the foundations are laid and as the walls are constructed um they're also kind of bricked and mortared and plastered and painted and carpeted so that by the time you get halfway up the walls you have pictures on them and um and you could uh, and you'd have one draft and by the time you get to the chimney you have uh you, it's your it's your last line and all that might get done to a novel is it gets kind of polished or you know and um, edited um and and that that it means that the start of a novel is is it, on some whatever conscious or subconscious level is um going to be extrapolated through the um, architecture of the book um, and all of the kind of themes and everything exists within the opening. Um, and uh, so it's a very kind of slow way of writing, but you don't have these rough drafts. And I'm definitely in that category as opposed to the macro um, planner, which has got, you know, will create a blueprint and will kind of have a good sense of where the no what the novel will be, what will happen. They um, might throw up kind of scaffolding and then they'll fill out one room upstairs and then they'll, you know, do the stairway and then they'll decide that actually that room should be downstairs and they'll move it around and they'll have these rough drafts and it's um and that uh, you often kind of hear about people saying they did 10 or 12 or 15 drafts of a book to me that's inconceivable i only really have one draft and then years of editing there's a line in the wild laughter where the chief says we all meant well and look where it got us and I'm wondering to what extent um, the novel is a commentary on Celtic Tiger Ireland. Um, I think so, yes. It, I, I, to what extent, um, I suppose it's not for me to say, but it's also a novel about, um, you know, late capitalism in the sense that it's, so it, it is obviously particularly Irish, but also universal in the sense that and the transformation that's taking place um, and people's participation in that transformation um, is uh, very suspect. Um, and so, I mean, Ireland obviously had a very, had a unique experience of the, of the um, crash, the 2008 crash, which I sometimes find I'm, um, in an interview, for example, um, overseas, someone might say Ireland had this, you know, unique um, crash that was completely distinct from everywhere else, or something on top of the finance, the housing crash of two thousand and eight. Um, and it's true, but it's also a little misleading in the sense that it's a sim, it's a similar effects that it's just that it was on steroids in Ireland because the um, the boom had been so short lived and so recent, you know. Uh, you know, Ireland was, you know, the poor man of Europe in the 50s and 60s and 70s, even into the 80s. And um, it wasn't until the 90s that you had this absolutely rapid growth. Um, and, um, you know, between, I think the decade between 95 and 2005, uh, house prices went up by 270%. And so that was, it was unprecedented. Um, but also, so that's maybe what defines the crash uh, for me um, as, um, so the, the Irish aspect of it and what makes it kind of Celtic Tiger-esque as opposed to just a general kind of um, upward, mo the, the end of, of the perception of upward mobility, not that that was ever evenly distributed, um, has to do with the national pathology, I suppose, that, you know, um, after, the, after Ireland gained independence, it didn't have very long of feeling any kind of sense of enjoyment. You know, there was a brief period um, in the war when food was in such high demand from the UK and um, that, uh, you know, actually we, Ireland fared pretty well. But then very soon after those, you know, the, uh, um, just the depression, grim, the grimmest decades, you know, in, um, in Ireland's independence for sure, in the fifties in particular. And so I think there's that recent history that, Almost as soon as you ha as the country experienced, um, you know, self uh, sovereignty and self governance and ownership of its direction and future, um, that perished in our hands in the sense of its attainability, you know, of of um, um, of well being and self sufficiency's attainability, and so um, then when you have the financial crash, the Celtic Tiger post Celtic Tiger crash, I think people in to a degree, or at least some people, internalized this uh, sense that people were, had gotten um, 
uh, had gotten ahead of themselves or that they never potentially they're returning to their natural state of being um, lacking in discipline and needing to be disciplined and needing to be um, humble and needing to have, you know, um, the Catholic modesty and, um, you know, needing to kind of self-disparage um, and um, self-discipline. And that's an uh, that's an ideology of austerity, you know, um, that, uh, the, sorry, I'm going all over the place, but hopefully it'll, it'll all cohere at some point. You know, this is a potato farm novel. And um, when I was thinking about what might come up in um, interviews, I was thinking, well, someone's going to mention the famine, you know, when I went back to The Economist um, and the editorial that was published in The Economist in 1847. And it said um, that uh, um, the innocent suffer with the guilty. This is kind of a melancholy truth um, and one of the conditions on which all society exists. Um, and every breach in morality and breach in social order brings its own punishment um, and inconvenience. And that this is a first law of civilization, you know, that, that as soon as there's not perfect security, there isn't going to be prosperity. This was the reaction then, which is ex almost exactly the same. I mean, it might as well have been republished in 2009. Um, so even though it was coming from our own government, you know, um, I think Brian Lenehan on, on primetime came on and said, you know, we all partied, which, which of course wasn't true, but people internalized that because of, or at least some people, because of the history of the country. So that aspect of it is very Irish, but the crash and, you know, the uh, property and banking deregulation, um, that's gl a global problem that has to do with neoliberalism and you know um late capitalism the, the what we have as our political system um and so that makes it i i think i hope it makes it uh, relevant uh, to any story of um boom and bust and any story of kind of social mobility um disappearing i noticed that there's a few places in the novel where Potatoes, for example, might be written about in a way that I've never heard potatoes described or written about before and really um, fresh and original writing and so many references, wonderful references to the land and farming life. And I'm wondering where this empathy with agricultural life, with the land stems from. Um. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, so I'm from the country. Um, Orchid and the Wasp was a very urban novel, um, but this, uh, uh, so it was kind of, a, it was a joy to have such a contrast um, in the environment of this book. Um, and I think it, I needed it to be somewhere that was landlocked because uh, part of, you know, the first images of the book the feeling you know you get when you have, when you, you think you might have a novel um was a claustrophobic feeling and um, so uh, it kind of necessitated somewhere in the midlands and my own you know in my own upbringing i was very uh i found the landscape intimidating um and i suppose i was very um anxious uh child as well i, I know you've talked about this before danielle with yourself i i definitely had that i was very i was afraid of um uh afraid of men and afraid of um dogs and you know we we had to cycle to school um my older sister and i and she used to cycle in front of me to, you know, as a kind of protector. And I just remember having this envy for people who didn't need to be afraid or intimidated. Um, and so, and then that this is, I, I suppose, as a, as a child, I ascribed that to men, even though it would have been my, my older sister that was my protector. Um, uh, but I did, you know, and, and I had a sibling who was uh, um, attacked by a dog uh, fairly badly. Um, and so the, this kind of was coming in to the sense of landscape. And as, as I grew older, and this kind of changed. And uh, I desperately wanted to um, have I def desperately wanted to reestablish those um, erroneous dynamics, you know, that were created in my youth, and so uh, I started to kind of make a uh, an effort to feel 
um, that I had or to convince myself that I had um, enough self-protection to be able to move through landscape so you know I do love going on long distance bike rides you know across the country <laughs> and and that's very much because of this that's in order to try and feel as if um, a landscape doesn't oppress but it can accommodate. I don't know how much that has to do with the novel and whether we're just turning into a therapy session. <laughs> No, there is a beautiful sense of farming and land in a way that's totally, totally fresh from the novel. I, I loved that. One of the many things I loved about it. Madeline, did you want to ask a question? You know, I might, I, I would actually. Um, well, first of all, I, I'd like to ask Keelan, um, why did you choose to set your novel in Roscommon and do you intend to go back there on holiday soon? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think I'll be kicked out? <laughs> there is no accounting for it. I think um, you'll either get the freedom of the county <laughs> uh, or you'll be booted out of the place. I, and I don't want to um, uh, predict spoilers, <laughs> but your characters are fascinating and extremely unpleasant from my point of view anyway. Um, I, I was fascinated by them. Um, but I just wondered, um, uh, did you spend time in Roscommon or did you just drag that one out of the... <laughs> the, la the landscape would be very similar to where I'm from. And um, I mean, we, I definitely would have spent a good deal of time in Roscommon when I was younger. Um, but you know, the the, the the character barely goes to the end of the road in the book. So in a way, you don't really get to um, see Roscommon per se. Um, it could be anywhere. And that's the fault of the um, protagonist. You know, he has, uh, with many of his faults, there are a lot of things that he can't <laughs> see for us. Um, so uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the Chris O'Dowd is doing the audiobook. <laughs> And because he's a Ross Commoner, I feel at least maybe this will help me with Ross Common and <laughs> they'll feel they have to <laughs> they have to be okay with it. But uh, but no, it's certainly the, the book the, the book when it's from when it's from a first person perspective, you cannot help I mean I, I never really want to write a book where I tell where I point out and use characters and kind of point them point out their flaws and their failings from an authorial you know, Victorian and um, judgmental perspective. I kind of want to try and get get at their truth and um, and hopefully um, demonstrate um, the reasoning and for their being the way they are. I wondered if you had uh, if you decided immediately on the point of view that being of Hart, Doherty, Hart, Hart Black. Or did you ever consider any of the other characters in terms of point of view? Um, because they're all quite fascinating. And I found Nora, the mother in particular, um, extremely uh, intriguing. Um, she's quite a powerful, enigmatic character. Um, uh, there is a scene where she's uh, collecting seaweed off the beach when they go on their little um, day and night trip and um, their one day holiday I suppose you'd call it and she's bagging seaweed on the beach for no reason and I I found her I again I don't want to uh, reveal any spoilers but I found her fascinating as well they're all fascinating but did you just I, I, was I sure that it would be hard? Yeah, thank you for asking that. And I mean, if the if the you know if if the uh, if there's ever a movie made or anything in my head, you know, in the dreams, and um, I, I see Nora's presence a lot larger than it is in the book. She was very important to me, and um, but unfortunately, Hart fails her so abysmally, um, and it's one of the bigger tragedies of the book to me. Um, uh, that 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 he doesn't manage to make the effort. Um, I know she would have to meet him halfway, but um, it's just to me it seems like such a a tragedy that can happen within a family where people coexist, but they never try and advance their 
um, relationship, you know, in the way of friendship with someone, you know, especially in the early, early stages of a friendship, you think, oh, we've gotten, we've gotten to the next level. You know, when people often with family, they just stay stuck. Um, uh, and it has to come from a willingness, you know, to advance a relationship. Um, and so I find that, yeah, I find that a tragic aspect. I did the very first image of the book that I had, the very, very first image was of Hart in, I knew he was an adult in his, the in his childhood bedroom and that his mom was looking through the keyhole to see if he was alive, <laughs> uh, you know, and that that was the dynamic. That it, of course, there's nothing like that in the book, but that was an image that came to me and something about that dynamic, I felt whatever is the dynamic between these two people, it has something to do with the absence of the father um, and the, um, the two pe these two people's uh, inability to help one another through it. Um, and so even though the, it's the sibling relationship that will probably get you know, talked about the most or you know, focused on, um, to me that dynamic uh, was very important. Um, and yeah, I, I, I suppose I never want to write um, a, character's, a character or an experience that I am immune from as a writer. And so the only, maybe a, a, a key reason why I couldn't write from Nora's experience, uh, perspective, is because I am immune from the life that she led, whereas I am not from the life that Hart um, could, could have led. Um, you know, because I have, you know, more awareness of her history, there's much more that I know about her than entered into the novel. And I know that it's beyond my remit of knowledge, of, of experience. And I would feel uncomfortable writing a book from her perspective for that reason. Um, yeah, I, I don't know whether that's a, 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 any interest or use. No, I, I think there, there just, there is such, um, uh, you know, tragedy uh, in that kind of non-communication um, in the family. Uh, as regards the black humor, I, I found it was very interesting um, that you engaged with the idea of the wild laughter. I love the title. Um, and I wondered if you could tell me if that title came to you straight away and what, what your understanding of it is in terms of Irish people in particular. Mm -hmm. I think it's an Irish thing. Yeah, um, so I, I remember having the title really early. I'm sort of obsessed with titles and, um, and I often, perhaps mistakenly, and this might be an Achilles heel later on, um, will it latch to a title and then insist that that's the story that I have to write um, and because the title has compelled me so much um, and it might, not be, it might be that I'm not ready to write that story. Um, and that has happened uh, and I've wasted a lot of time. So due to a title as a kind of magnet, um, but I had it. And then thinking about it later, um, I, there were a number of places where that kind of phrasing came up, but one of them was from Shakespeare's Love's Labour is Lost. Um, and there's a character in it who uh, this kind of um, suitor, uh, Lord Byron is, um, a, a young woman challenges him to go and spend a month in hospital to because he's got this renowned wit and she thinks he should spend a month there to prove herself to him and to to help the sick laugh um, uh, because of his exceptional wit and he says um, to move wild laughter in the throat of death um, it cannot be it is impossible to it, mirth cannot move a soul in agony and so I, I I don't know how conscious that was. I don't remember because I started writing this book eight years ago um, and everything gets a little blurry. But, uh, but I think that was also echoing in. I had, the title came to me and then later on, I rediscovered it maybe um, via the playtext and it still felt, it still held true um, in the sense of whether or not you can laugh at something that's really bleak and grim. And, um, I'm really interested um, uh, to see what happens with this book, whether or not, for example, the Americans <laughs> um, find it funny. I mean, every Irish person that I've spoken to talks about it being funny, which is such a relief <laughs> because uh, imagine if they didn't. I mean, that would be a disaster. But I don't know. I think it's, 
it is part of a national um, personality that, and also a literary heritage that um, we laugh at. Uh, we need to need to um, seek the relief and um, processing that laughter enables. I know this isn't relevant at all, but I remember um, being so sad at a funeral. It was a friend of mine and her dad had died and she was sitting in the front row of the, um, of the and I'm not a great one for, um, you know, going to churches. But as soon as I went up, she said that I looked so sad that she started laughing. And then I started laughing as well. And we were killing ourselves laughing right in the front. There was her mother and the family and the priest and everything and we just couldn't stop laughing you know that tension between you, you, you know you're on an emotional level where it just tips into the inappropriate laughter rather than the tears yeah. and I, I it's terribly embarrassing but I, I something that happens in my family all the time all yeah time. it happens to me too I have a fits fits of laughter it only happens maybe once every three months but it's always in a highly inappropriate scenario. Um, <laughs> I also had a funeral instance of that. Um, and then were tears, tears of laughter. And then I once had it in an amateur orchestra where everyone um, <laughs> plucked the pizzicato, but it was all wrong. You know, it was just out of time. <laughs> and it had to be da ba da ba pluck, you know, <laughs> and they didn't get it right. And I just, I started laughing. And I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't stop such that the whole work Orchestra had to stop playing. The conductor stopped and just stared at me, and it kind of went through the mechanisms where they thought this was funny and it lends, but it actually had reached a manic. Yes, <laughs> so, we better not start it now. <laughs> <laughs> I better hand back to Danielle. Sorry, Danielle, I'm going off the point here. <laughs> um, just one more question um, before we ask you to read for us again, Keelan. I was so impressed by the courtroom scenes in the novel. Um, I practiced law for a good few years myself. I thought the courtroom and the legal drama side of it was so well done. And I'm wondering if you had to do much research for that. How did you go about researching it? Um, thank you. Um, I, I did. I generally don't do research because I'm a horrendous procrastinator really something else like you know my my writing process is to reach peak self-loathing and and you know it can be i mean i can have so much self-loathing you couldn't believe it and then i find a new level of self-loathing and then it becomes unbearable and that's that's how i managed to start <laughs> and i kind of almost have to have this i can't just go from one project to the other it's 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 awful but um uh with, so I, know, I try not to write types of stories that would require research because I, that's a license to procrastinate. Uh, so, uh, but, and I also don't plan, so I don't know what's going to come up. So I'll, I'll, I'll research something that, you know, for a few hours if it's required. Um, but something that would take, you know, substantial, like, as in, you know, doing reading for a few months. I've never written anything like that. Um, this book, I had no idea that there would be a, a court case in it. Um, so that happened during the writing process and I did actually, I was um, living in New Zealand at the time and I did have to fly back um, much to my environmental scientist partner's um, uh, goal. Um, I had to fly back to um, go and spend time in, in the courts um, and also to meet with a judge, uh, Patria McDonnell. Uh, she um, was my kind of consult, a friend, you know, she's a friend and um, we sat down and I remember describing to her what was happening and the situation and she was having to phone other judges because it wasn't, it, there was never, had, there had never been a case like it um, and she was phoning other judges and then we got to kind of this impasse and literally as I, I remember the day sitting, because I don't, I, I, I can't really do plot, but all of a sudden I kind of said to her, what if, <laughs> and I can't spoil the novel now. And, and she said, now that, uh, <laughs> and she was so excited by um, the legality of it that, that I thought, well, this, this feels a lot like what the thrill that other people must get when they have a plot. <laughs> and uh, so that was really, that was really fun. Um, but it was very much, um, it was, I'd say limited in, in the research side, um, but I did want to get it right. 
it doesn't take a huge amount of pages in the book, um, but I think if I'd have gotten it wrong, it would have been glaring. Well, it reads absolutely brilliantly. And I think it's fantastic that the novel actually had judicial input into um, its making in a way. Can we ask you to read for us again, please, Kieran? Thank you so much for those lovely questions. Oh, we could, I think we could stay chatting all afternoon, I think, really. I'm trying to restrain myself here as well, but <laughs> I will. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm going to read something I haven't ever read before. So this is an experiment. <laughs> you can't you can't downsize a potato field, a on five. The chief called from his tractor the following night when I went out with a sandwich. The chief's parents, who were burned to slags in a hay barn when he was a youth, were Gwelgors. He kept on the bit of Irish to honour them. I made my way along the mud bank towards him. I wanted him inside in the sitting room with the toilet paper flopped across his wide lap like a dead stingray, and me sprawled sleepily on the couch, pretending to read Philadelphia, here I come. I wanted to get straight to the point with the chief, like the garrulous private, and make frantic recommendations to do with the properties. Wasn't there some poor illiterate creature who doesn't get out much or doesn't have the internet, who by some miracle doesn't know the home, home soil has gone to slurry, who'd happily lap up a villa in Malaga with a shared swimming pool and a dishwasher and a motorised awning and oversized tiles? Alternatively, wasn't there investing to be done now that we were all in the pits and could only crawl upwards? Wasn't it time to let go of this outmoded life? If we could sell something, I'd live without a kidney, I had my looks, or arrange a countywide poker championship for Cormac to work the odds of with his broad dingy and brain on him for us to win ourselves back, slowly but surely. What I ended up saying, holding out the sandwich, was, there's lamb in that. He laboured out of the tractor. It was dragging a disc-type hiller behind for bringing up earth to the potato vines. Though the engine was turned off and its hoovering noise had fallen silent, the pattern of it carried on, the angled discs scooping in soil like a child's hands gathering sand to make a castle. The vines bowing, bowing down to let the tractor pass over them and then springing up behind, seeming renewed, devoted, doing lines. We both squinted back down the length of the row that had been turned a deeper shade of earth illumined by a flash of moonlight leading straight back to our lit house an acre off. A manner of lines, he said. I'll be doing it by hand before long, spraying pesticide one squirt at a time. He took the sandwich from me. Out of a Mr. Muscle bottle, he winked and put the quarter of a sandwich in his mouth at once. Opportunities come in all ways and sizes, this time in the form of a stuffed gob, maybe? No. It was too soon. But then my mind was so filled with the large things I wanted to say, I was stuck for small ones. The chief chewed away and swallowed dryly. Never one to force talk. He was happy enough in his calm refueling. We're back to school Tuesday. Tomorrow's off, I said. He made a noise of acknowledgement. Cormac's doing college stuff. He looked at me sideways and spoke with a full mouth. Have you enough to be doing? I cringed suddenly at my school talk, so late in the day. I'd scraped together three of the six Leaving Cert subjects last year, Irish geography and past maths. Managing the others this year was doubtful. You could help me widen the pond below, the chief said, almost optimistic, drain out the wet year that's in it. Yeah, I'll do that. I want to do something though. I don't know. Some variety of physical mastery would have been the thing to want, but I tried not to lie to him. I like making things, woodworking maybe, if I wasn't so tired from... I looked from field to sky to lay the blame elsewhere for my wreckery. Huge iron clouds blockaded the moon. Gandhi wouldn't have had the fortitude for stargazing in these parts. I heard the promising outbreath of a laugh. Home brewing's inevitable, one of these days, I said. But maybe I should take that fiddle down from the attic. Learn to play a woeful recession tune, he grimaced. Woeful it would be. Don't be demanding fiddle lessons is all I'll say. 
I saw his hand go to his pocket in the gloom. Always on about the travel, you might take a look at your own country before scarpering off to Germany or Cambodia, wherever it is you're thinking. Walking's as good a pastime as any, to know yourself. There's history in these flatlands to fill a sizable mind. No elbowing tourists along the stone wall. I looked across to let him read my expression. Oh, I do forget about the dogs. He took in the last of his sandwich. He didn't press me on it. I handed him a flask of grey tea in exchange for kitchen towels. Then I gauged him loosened enough. So I took a deep breath and spoke quickly. We could declare bankruptcy. It was Cormac came up with it, so it'll be well thought out. The thing is, neither of us wants the farm, Dad. It's a good life, but Cormac's too arrogant for us. He said he will in his shite work for government subsidies. And you can go anywhere with a face like mine. I might meet a girl who won't want this. I'm thinking Australia sounds the job. And the thing is, if you go bankrupt, you could retire then. What was the point of the houses and the whole mess anyways? He had the mouthful long swallowed and was looking into the restless landscape, sporadically moonlamped, as if the night was giving sign to a dangerous reef up ahead. He was six foot two and had another year of standing to his full height. Then a five year crash and collapse. I felt a gossoon stood beside him. You lads and your grand plans, he said, not to me, but to the hours of work ahead. I was glad not to have his gaze on me then. There was no way of knowing how wrong I'd been, but I was relieved not to have the idea strangled in my head any longer. You can tell your brother, your ideas are for lining the pockets of men like Morrigan and making them more self-righteous while you're at it. I tried to understand him, but it was a tone I hadn't heard. I guessed right that he wasn't talking bankruptcy, just as an aside, he's talking about the boys who um, slaughtered some lambs the night before trying to, in an act of revenge. It was to get back at him, I said. The chief lifted his stubbled jowl, jowl, the cap shadowing his face. On the insurance, then lambs went, and Morrigan unable to sell them for the price he was asking, the fierce market that's in it. He was waiting till the last minute to get rid of them. He telephoned Jerry this morning, boastful of the Easter godsend. The chief would never have spoken so freely with Cormac. It was as if the night air and the waxy ears of his harmless youngest son were the particular conditions for talking. But I would have gone ignorant just then. Like a gomi, I said, I'll do an hour for you now. I'm used to doing lines. He didn't smile, but threw the thermos into the tractor and hauled the new weight of himself up onto the seat. What ye lads don't understand. He stopped himself. Sure, why would ye? Who'd have taught you? The engine coughed up and off he moved in his tired machinery, making lines as straight as humanly possible into the unknowable night. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elin. Thank you so much. That's so interesting. The, the communication between the different characters is so fascinating because um, that's a rare example of where they are actually attempting to communicate, aren't they? Yeah. I wanted to be, I wanted it to be different, you know, to the, cause there's all this Philadelphia here I come echoing. Um, but I wanted it to be different to screwballs, you know, the father figure in that uh, play who is completely taciturn. Um, and, uh, you know, so who is actually to blame? The chief is, blames himself um, for, for everything, but he's not to blame whatsoever. It was great talking to you, Keelan. I think we could just have gone on for hours and hours. It's a magnificent book and congratulations. And it's wonderful to see it getting such deservedly superb reviews. And thanks for talking to us this afternoon. Thank you so much. Today we have a free book raffle for you taking place via our Twitter and Facebook accounts. So if you go to Twitter, at Fiction Friary or to Facebook at Fiction of the Friary. We'll have details there of how you can win one of five free books by sharing the link to Keelan's readings and discussions today.
Thank you so much, Keelan, for being our guest at Fiction at the Friary. Um, we've really enjoyed the readings from the Wild Laughter and um, we wish you every success with it and in the future. Um, thanks so much to Danielle as well. And thanks to all of the people who check in with us, um, all of the people who've supported Fiction at the Friary since we began in January 2017. So thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. It was wonderful.